today is the 97th anniversary of the birth of Elder LeGrand Richards, who left us on Tuesday, January 11th of this year. His passing has reminded thoughtful people of the life of President Wilford Woodruff, the fourth president of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. Many of us here tonight have touched the hand or heard the voice of Elder Richards. He, in turn, heard the voice and touched the hand of President Woodruff, who was an associate of the Prophet Joseph Smith. Someday, you may be able to tell your grandchildren you once heard the Grand Richards who knew men who had known and lived by the prophet. Thus the generations of mankind touch each other. Accordingly, I have been impressed tonight to share with you some things which President Woodruff has left for us to contemplate. Let me review a few matters with you. Wilfred Woodruff was born in Farmington, Hartford County, Connecticut, March 1, 1807. He learned the trade of a miller. He worked as a miller in a number of communities in his native state. He first learned of Joseph Smith through a newspaper article in the spring of 1832. He was 25. Some 19 or 20 months later, he met Elder Zira Pulsifer and Elijah Cheney in Rushland, New York, where he had moved and was farming. A few days later, he was baptized by Zira Pulsifer. Four months later, he met Joseph Smith for the first time in the streets of Kirtland, Ohio. And I would like to read to you about his first meeting with the Prophet Joseph Smith. He recorded, Before I saw Joseph, I said I did not care how old he was or how young he was. I did not care how he looked, whether his hair was long or short. The man that advanced the revelation was a prophet of God. I knew it for myself. I first met Joseph Smith in the streets of Kirtland. He had on an old hat and a pistol in his hand. Said he, Brother Woodruff, I've been out shooting at a mark, and I wanted to see if I could hit anything. Then said he, Have you any objection to it? Not at all, said I. There is no law against a man shooting at a mark that I know of. He invited me to his house. He had a wolf skin, which he wanted me to help him tan. He wanted it to sit on while driving his wagon team. Now many might have said, you are a pretty prophet, shooting a pistol and tanning a wolf skin. Well, said President Woodruff, we tanned it and used it while making a journey of a thousand miles. That was Zion's camp. This was my first acquaintance with the Prophet Joseph, and from that day until the present, and with all the difficulties and afflictions we had been called to pass through, I never saw a moment when I had any doubts with regard to this work. Wilford Woodward made his home with the Prophet in Kirtland for about a week. On Sunday of that week, Joseph called a priesthood meeting. They gathered in a little cabin, Joseph and Hiram Smith, Oliver Cowdery, Brigham Young, Heber C. Kimball, Parley and Orson Pratt, William E. McClellan. Young Woodruff heard them all bear testimony. 
Joseph spoke last and said, Brethren, I am very much edified and interested in listening to your testimony, but I want to tell you that you know no more concerning this work than a parcel of little children. Then he told them that this work would fill the whole earth and that all nations would have to hear the proclamation of the gospel. You sang something about that in the opening hymn tonight. A few days later, on May 1st, he left Kirtland with the vanguard of Zion's camp, marching to Missouri. As a priest, he served his first mission in Arkansas and Tennessee, was ordained an elder during that time on April 4, 1835. On April 21, 1836, while on that mission, he learned from David W. Patton of the Twelve that he had been called to membership in the Second Quorum of the Seventy. Returning to Kirtland later that year, he was called to the First Quorum of the Seventy, December 20, 1836. Then came a second mission to the Eastern States and the Fox Islands in the summer of 1837. He was called to membership in the Quorum of the Twelve, July 8, 1838. Learning of the call, on August 9th, he returned west to Illinois, December 19th, 1838. Then proceeding westward to Missouri, he was ordained to the apostleship by Brigham Young at the temple site in far west Missouri, April 26, 1839. His next mission was to England, going to Preston, Lancashire in the spring of 1840. Then, inspired to go south, he went to the home of John Benbow in Ledbury, Herefordshire. There he baptized nearly 600 people in the spring of 1840. On February 8, 1841, he secured the British copyright to the Book of Mormon at Stationers Hall in London, together with Heber C. Kimball. Then he returned to the United States with Brigham Young and other members of the Twelve and proceeded to Nauvoo by October 5 of 1841. His subsequent service in building the American West and as president of the Church deserves study by every young man and young woman. He plowed the first acres when the pioneers arrived where the Center Theater in Salt Lake City now stands on 3rd South and State Street. Although he presided over the church as president of the Twelve following the death of President John Taylor in July 1887, he was not sustained as president of the church until April 7, 1889. He left instructions that upon his death and that of his successors, the First Presidency should be organized without delay. Elder Legrand Richards, as a boy of seven, saw him and attended one of the sessions of the dedication of the Salt Lake Temple in April 1893. President Woodruff then died September 2, 1898, in San Francisco, California, at the age of 91 a tremendous leader and a tremendous life of experience. From his rich experience and with that background, I'd like to call to your attention some concepts that I believe will be of help to you as university students and as future leaders. Said he in an address, May 1st, 1857, speaking to young people. You are now laying a foundation in the bloom and the beauty of youth and in the morning of your days to step forth upon the stage of life to act a conspicuous part in the midst of the most important dispensation and generation in which man has ever lived. 
And I can say in truth and safety that the result of your future lives, the influence which you will exert among man, and finally your eternal destiny for time and eternity, will in a great measure depend upon the foundation which you lay in the days of your youth. The manner in which you store your mind and cultivate it while young." Close quote. As university students, I commend your opportunities to you. Store your mind with useful knowledge and cultivate it. Take advantage of the facilities afforded you by your university. During my undergraduate days, and also as a graduate student, I found it very profitable about once a month to circulate throughout the periodical room in the university library. I would sample the journals in the various fields, from accountancy to zoology. I was curious to know what people were thinking and saying in other fields besides my own. Some things were more easily understood than others, but the effort was worthwhile. Occasionally, I would come across an article that I would examine more closely, sometimes reading the entire thing. Another practice I found extremely useful was to gain a stack permit as soon as I was eligible for the same. This permitted me access to the inner resources of the university library. Unfortunately, it did not come until I was a graduate student, but I took advantage of it and again would take a few minutes every so often to browse through fields not my own major. As an undergraduate, I early discovered that the main reading room of the university library was well stocked with all sorts of reference works. Furthermore, the card catalog gave me access to the entire resources of the university library. I majored in history and political science, studying, among other things, a great deal of European history. But having always been a bookworm, I was interested in literature. The university requirements did not permit me to take the courses in literature I would have liked, so I read by myself. During those undergraduate years, particularly the junior and senior years, I read a great many historical novels, chief among them being those of Alexander Dumas, with her picturization of events in the 17th and 18th century France and England. How does one learn? Let us call upon the wisdom of President Wilford Woodruff. Said he on one occasion, there is one thing I wish particularly to impress upon your minds, and that is the importance of improving your time while young in treasuring up knowledge and learning those things which will be useful to you in afterlife. Continuing, he said, I know from experience, and so do most parents, that the child cannot appreciate the worth of true intelligence, the importance of improving their time and storing up useful knowledge while they are young, as they will when they come to act upon the stage of life and feel the full force of responsibilities of training up children. Do not be discouraged if you cannot learn all at once. Learn one thing at a time, learn it well, and treasure it up. Then learn another truth and treasure that up. And in a few years, you will have a great store of useful knowledge, which will not only be a great blessing to yourselves and your children, but to your fellow men." Close quote. 
Today, in the age of television and video discs, it is easy to spend a great deal of time watching and listening. Carefully selected, such experiences can add much to your learning. But please do not neglect the privilege of reading. One can absorb many more words, ideas, and pages in a half hour of reading than is available in the usual television program. I was inspired some years ago by an intimate acquaintanceship with a member of the Council of the Twelve, who, as a matter of course, would read as many as 200 books a year, church books, scientific books, general information, and other useful literary materials. Parenthetically, I can say I know it because it was Sister Durham's father, Elder John A. Witso, the Council of the Twelve, an enormous capacity for absorbing knowledge. He did it by using his time wisely. On one occasion, President Woodruff said, quote, I have felt for a long time, and I think I have realized to some extent, that the duties resting upon us are very great, and we ought to strive to improve in wisdom and knowledge and in the principles of government in order that we may know how to be, it didn't say presidents or governors, but how to be fathers and mothers and learn how to be counselors and how to preside, not only in our own family circles, but wherever we may be called to act." Unquote. And certainly there's no more important place to learn those things than in the family. He was vigorous in expressing his views as to how young people may bless family life. It is the most important unit of society and of the Church, said he. Quote, Obey your parents in all things and comfort their hearts, for you have the power to do this. When they are weary and pressed with the cares of life, seek to ease their burdens and smile upon them in their hours of sorrow. And that will cast the charm of joy and peace around them, which they cannot obtain from any other source. Be kind to your brothers and sisters and all with whom you associate. Kind words and good manners will cost you nothing and will add greatly to the happiness of those around you." Unquote. Today in the world and in our immediate circles, we see too much of anything but kind words and good manners. Can we not promote them in our own conduct, including choice of language, tone of voice, courtesy at all times? President Woodruff further counseled, quote, be happy. Be contented. Enjoy the days of your youth. Enjoy your peaceful homes. Enjoy the society of your parents, brothers and sisters, while you have an opportunity. For the days of your youth will soon be gone. Manhood and womanhood will be upon you with all of its attendant cares and responsibilities." Unquote. President Woodruff believes sincerely in the reality of revelation, that God lived, that Jesus Christ, his Son, was the great revelator through his prophets and by means of the Holy Spirit. As president of the Church, one October day, 1892, he said, quote, One subject more I want to name, and that is with regard to our future. I suspect some of you are concerned about your future. And this is what he said. I will tell you what the Lord 
has revealed to me. You talk of revelation. I have had a good number of revelations. We are not particularly required to write all of the revelations given to us. Joseph Smith wrote revelations in his day, and we have them to read. There has been a good deal said about the rising generation of Latter-day Saints. I will tell you what will come to pass. My sons, the sons of my counselors, the sons of these apostles, and the sons of this people will rise up by the power of God and will take this kingdom and bear it off. You need make no mistake about this matter. They are the element that God has ordained, the same as he ordained us to do his work. Our posterity will not forsake the Lord, nor their fathers, nor their mothers, nor the work in which they are engaged. Too many of them, it is true, have been led astray, but many of them have been found where they should not be too many, but the bulk of the sons of this people will remain true and faithful to this work." Unquote. And using the language he did, referring to sons in the future, I am certain he would not exclude the young women, the daughters. For another occasion, he made clear his belief that, quote, it is the privilege of every man and woman in this kingdom to enjoy the spirit of prophecy, which is the spirit of God. And to the faithful, it reveals such things as are necessary for their comfort and consolation and to guide them in their daily duties." Unquote. As president of the Church in October 1892, he said, speaking further about Revelation, these mountains contain thousands upon thousands of devoted women, holy women, righteous women, virtuous women, who are filled with the inspiration of the Almighty God. Yes, these women have brought forth an army of sons and daughters in these mountains by the power of God, and these sons and daughters partake of the inspiration of their mothers as well as their fathers. Yes, we have revelation. The Church of God could not live 24 hours without revelation." Unquote. I commend to you the lives of our great leaders. I commend to you the lives of great men and women in all generations. From them we can learn much we can proceed to the next phase of life if we know more of the minutes of the previous meeting, if I can use that expression. Longfellow's words in the Psalm of Life may have aggravated the critics for mixing his metaphors and so forth, but the truth remains quoting Henry W. Longfellow, that lives of great men all remind us we can make our lives sublime. And departing, leave behind us footsteps in the sands of time. May you take advantage of your years at this university. May you take advantage of all its opportunities to wh of which you are capable, and may you couple them with increased growth in faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, the Savior of the world, whose splendid life must be the model for us all. As to his divine nature, character, and sacrifice for our sakes, I testify, and I further testify, that as it's gone now from Greenland's icy mountains to Africa's and India's coral strand, as we sang tonight, you will live to see it extend even further 
in your day and generation because it is the work of the Redeemer of the world, the Lord Jesus Christ. And I so testify in the name, the sacred name of Jesus Christ. Amen.